All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Seema Kacharian. Um, right before we begin, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. As a campus that really values diversity and educating its um, students in a variety of ways, we really want to encourage and invite everybody here to contemplate the people who existed on this land before us and who continue to exist on this land. I want to humble us today by acknowledging that the land we are standing on was originally inhabited by the Kalapuya people, specifically the Atfalati Band, which belonged to the Grand Ronde and Warm Springs Confederation, as well as the many other tribes who made their home along what is now known as the Columbia River. I want to thank those descendants um, for being the original stewards and protectors of these lands since time immemorial. Um, they are the people who not only walked this land before us and stewarded the land, but created it to be what it is today, to, to what we know it to be. And we owe it to those people and to ourselves and this land to take a, no a moment to acknowledge the problems of suffering, genocide, colonialist policy, and more. And so I really want to give a moment at the beginning of this talk for people to reflect on um, what their relationship is to the land. What is your positionality um, and how do you benefit from settler colonialism which permeates so much of modern life and the people who existed here before us and who continue to exist but who stewarded the land before we came to be here. And so I, this is something that I think really ties into what we were gonna, we're gonna talk about today because we were sure to include native voices as well in our um, project, which you will hear about soon. And so I wanna emphasize how honored we are by the collective work of many native nations, leaders and families and the resilience and resistance, healing and creativity that they demonstrate. And so we are honored to be guests upon these lands. Well, thank you so much, Seema. That was a beautiful land acknowledgement. And thank you for creating that space for us to really connect and dig deeper on those views. My name is Carson Buck and I'm here with Seema Kacharian and I, we're presenting our experiment experience with Forest Grove and trying to put up a mural. Uh, I am a soon to be graduate at Pacific University with applied sustainability major as well as a Spanish minor and a philosophy minor. I've really, really come to love Forest Grove and the community I've been engaged with at Pacific University. It's just been a really cool experience and I'm beyond grateful for the challenges and the people I've gotten to meet and hopefully continue to meet. So this is just, I'm really grateful. Uh, here is Seema as well. Hi, so I'm really grateful as well, especially to be able to work with Carson. I am an anthropology and applied sustainability double major. I'm currently a senior, so hopefully Carson and I will be graduating together in just a couple of months. And- um, Woo! Yeah. It's exciting. And I'm also the um, current president of Students for Environmental Activism. And I've been in that club with Carson for a while too. So activism and is something that's really important to both of us. Hence, I think this project even coming to fruition is a product of that passion that we have. And I'm just, you know, thrilled to be able to talk to you all today about this project that we have um, poured a lot of our hearts into. And yeah, I'll leave Carson to kind of let, tell you the story of how we even came up with the idea to put up a mural in Forest Grove. This is the location. This is Forest Grove Park here on the screen behind you. And one day, Seema and I were, as well as with one of our other roommates, you know, the feeling was kind of indescribable, indescribable, probably for most people throughout this summer, where I kind of am the person to get people to go do something. So I got Seema and us to go to this park and kind of our worlds were all upside down. So we tried to re put it upright by, we decided to roll down this hill. Uh, you can, when the video continues to play, you'll see it to the left. As we roll down this hill, we see this American flag, which is pretty grim, ugly. It's just, a pretty good representation of America right now, if I do say so. However, it didn't feel like it connected to us for, not to us, it didn't feel like it connected to a grand 
scheme of most of America and the people that are withheld within this um, country. So we took that to want to change it. We wanted to put up a mural. We were like, well, why don't we raise unrep underrepresented voices and let them be represented within this mural? Let's create a conversation. Let's get people to, to dig deeper on why they may not want to help out other communities. And that's where the inspiration was ignited. Right, and so what Carson is saying is absolutely true. We rolled down a hill, which I don't know if you've ever done as a kid, but it's very therapeutic. And sometimes you just have to let your inner child out. And um, when we saw this wall and the state of it, it was at, I would say end of May, the beginning of the BLM protests. And our initial thought was, this wall is not representative of America in this moment because people were using the American flag in ways that were intimidating other groups of people. That's not to say that the American flag is not, you know, a symbol of patriotism or hope for people for others, but for certain people, this flag lately has been used as a symbol to oppress them um, and is associated with certain groups more than other groups something better could be here which celebrates diversity and those who have been marginalized and um, really just makes people of color in particular feel welcome because you know when you drive into Forest Grove this flag is one of the first things that you see if you're coming in from in Tillamook Forest entering Forest Grove so yeah so if you're coming in from the coast you're going to see this flag it's the first thing you're going to see when you enter Forest Grove so yeah, yeah, and so we, you know, we sat there and we said, this needs to be something that represents the diversity in Forest Grove, because I don't think that this is an accurate representation. And also, it was in bad condition, as you can kind of see by looking at it, and we felt that that was disrespectful, actually, to the flag and um, people, the people in this community. After we, you know, we looked at it and we said, this needs to be something else. We um, brainstormed what it needed to be, and we initially really wanted it to be in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, you'll see that the initial design was of three fists and names of folks who had lost their lives um, to police brutality and, you know, the big words of justice. So then we um, contacted Tom Gamble, who was the parks manager. That was the first person that we contacted. And we sent that email on June 1st, I believe it was like the first of the month and we just received a lot of, it's going to take time, like we'll respond to you, we'll let you know and like very vague um, directions about what to do about, about wanting to continue this project. And I'll also add really quickly that prior to our mural, which was eventually passed, um, this American flag design was put up in 2015 by the Boy Scouts. Um, they had no trouble getting it on the agenda within a couple of weeks, and it was passed um, in one city council meeting, I believe. And then the one before that was a uh, uh, design with a bunch of handprints. I can't remember who did it. And yeah. um, once again, that one also, because I we read about the history of of this wall and it, they were passed without difficulty without barriers really and so, we also hold story, we held, or knew of stories from other community members who knew of the passing of the last one and we recognized that there we were influenced with some implicit bias because all of the sudden the art commission of forest grove and the city council of forest grove wants a policy on something like this and it was when you hear the rest of our talk, you'll realize how frustrating that was because, oh, all of the sudden, now that there is a pressing art that is somewhat of, not somewhat, is representing a form of activism for including all communities, now needs a policy. But yeah. an American flag by a group of Boy Scouts doesn't, does not need to be analyzed and reconstructed. Right. You know, yeah. and there was this, even this discussion of, is this the city's voice when we were designing this mural? Um, and that was when this design that you currently see is up, that, that was the discussion. And it was funny to me because 
that wasn't even a discussion with the American flag. And not everybody does feel welcomed by the American flag. And that's just reality. That doesn't mean that it's not an, a great symbol, which I have to be careful to not really bash the flag. But mm-hmm. um, it just means that, you know, there are certain things that are questioned about whether or not they're the, they're the voice of people at large and certain things that aren't. And I think we have to be really mindful about that. Mm-hmm. How we came to this final design here um, before we kind of talk about the other barriers that we faced. This was our final, final design. And if you notice from the second design that the middle was changed. So the middle had three fists prior and now it all has a lotus flower, which was recommended by the some city council members as the fists were seen as violent. Now, we will dig deeper into that, but there were forms of racism at play when those things were acknowledged. Yeah, so there was definitely a lot of um, censorship and wanting to edit this design. And so what you kind of see is it took a lot of working with the city council to have to explain what we wanted to be in this. And um, and also to just really emphasize that those ideas that are within the design were actually um, thought of by people of color. We, we brought together groups of people of color and we asked them what you would want to see and what they would want to see in a mural design. And, you know, they mentioned things like farm workers, uh, land acknowledgement, like LGBTQ plus flag. Um, and they, they, yeah, native plants. They, they were the ones who came up with those ideas. And then we took those ideas to a, um, black local artist in Portland whose name is Jamali and he was the one who we said okay you have the creative freedom with these concepts as a person of color we want you to translate them how you feel appropriate and so you know we emphasize this to the city council and they there was still this level of wanting to really edit it and not just accept it for what it was which I think was frustrating but also understandable and it really taught us how to compromise to be honest because and so maybe I should make something more clear is when Seema and I started this video as we kind of took it on a part ourselves to to task up forces you know like we had jobs and lives going on on top of this so we had to divvy up what we were trying to accomplish in different ways especially when we had time and so I wrote or we but we both took the time to write certain grants to be able to pay this uh, Jamali for his work and his work had to con- constantly change due to the city council which is what is Sima is touching upon is this censorship and where this racism is coming into play within the, the city council because of suppressing those ideas of what the original artist had intended and felt to those words that we had originally put on from or put into words from the other communities of color that we spoke to within Forest Grove. Right. Lack of accessibility that I think furthers the idea that there was, and I won't, I'm, I'm going to shy away from saying racism, but like unconscious, like bias and barriers to people of color in being a part of this system. Um, because there was like, in trying to get this mural passed, you know, there were meetings that were, uh, you know, you could only speak if you showed up in person, which I think is not very accessible to people whose lives are higher risk to get COVID. It is also, you know, to something to think about that they wanted us to pay the mural artist out of our own pockets and then be reimbursed. And, you know, as students, that's not very accessible, but imagine being somebody who, who hardly makes enough income and you don't have that extra money to pay this artist. And it is expensive to pay somebody to to create a mural Mm -hmm. and then give that out of your own pocket till they have the time to reimburse you. So there's all these barriers that I think are really important to acknowledge because they actually speak to accessibility of being able to even do this project. So not only were we met with like resistance immediately where they said, this will take time. Like, we're not going to tell you the process. Like it'll just take time. And then once we got, we sent out an email and we had a bunch of friends, faculty and staff send out letters of support for this project they were all emailed back, us included, just this vague letter about how this process takes time and like, you know, it will be considered. And it was months before it even saw a city council meeting. Um, and then, you know, who has that time and that energy when you're you're trying to just get through life? And so I think that's something to, to think about, like how accessible is it for people? And then 
to keep asking a person of color to adjust their work, I don't think the emotional labor was accounted for. So I know I'm going on and on, but I just think we need to think about all these levels of accessibility and um, like the way, yeah, and acknowledge that, you know, there were certain things that weren't accounted for in the process, which I think is what makes it less accessible for people to yeah. get involved and do projects like this. I just put that idea down for a second, but I want to continue the video so our audience knows what these emails are shine, shown behind the screen here, or, or these are emails that Seema and I had both sent out to, to people, and this one right now on the screen is how we got so much voice within the, or voice sparked within the Forest Grove community is because we reached out to so many people to, hey, could you just send a paragraph in to the city council members to say that you are either of support or not support for this idea? Fortunately, that really helped us. That really helped our case and it really helped spark that conversation. And when Seema touches upon the idea of accessibility, we constantly were not only meeting with people who had similar ideals as us and wanted to help us, professors, as well as community members, as well as the city council, as well as the art commission. And within those, Simo and I would have side, side meetings, just us digging deeper on what we needed to make sure we, we paid attention to, maybe taking a step back and figure out what did we do wrong yesterday. And you know, we didn't always, I learned a lot. And number one, being patient. Uh, you know, I'm, we're not always right. And you learn that you make mistakes. For example, yeah. one day we had a meeting with Tom Gamble and somebody else uh, who works for the parks. And it was just me going in person with a mask on to the park and we would brainstorm ideas of like if i was a person of color that interaction with those two white man men would have gone a lot differently and i will never know what that interaction would have ever felt like but the privilege that we noticed that we experienced through this was also shown and recognized and it made it all the more frustrating because that accessibility isn't for everybody. And I guess that was something that we learned throughout this project. And I know personally that with going forward is I want to make sure that accessibility is, I want to do the best that I can to make sure that other people can also experience an ability to, to shine their voice and to use it and to make sure that it's represented because America's done. It can't continue to, to be like this, you know, change. Right needs to yeah and i think that's a really important point that you made about how much we learned about this process and i there was a point when we were actually uh either scraping or painting the wall which this the next portion of this video will kind of show us like actually working on it through rain and every single climate um where one of the women uh amy trace while she works at the university who is so kind in helping us she had been helping us mitigate the responses on social media. And by social media, I'm referring to- um, Door, Facebook. Yeah, Nextdoor and Facebook, which were the two primary platforms that we received a lot we of- Those keyboard lash. warriors. Yeah, we received a lot of uh, lashback on those platforms. And I didn't, we, we didn't have access to Nextdoor and on Facebook, I really am not on Facebook a lot. I try not to be on social media a lot in general. And so, um, Actually, Ramona and Amy were a very, very important part, and they they tried to help us mitigate those comments and kind of um, tell us what was going on, keep us in the loop, because some people even threatened to show up to this wall while we were painting and not let us keep painting or scraping the wall or whatever. Uh, uh, so to, to get to the point, um, she came up to us and she said, I am exhausted. Like, I cannot imagine how people feel having to respond to comments like this every single day of their lives. And she, she said, you know, basically, she cannot imagine what it is to be a person of color and have to deal with that constant racism and discrimination. Because what she was, like, responding to were a lot of comments of um, hatred and bias. This was a huge learning process for us to, you know, experience um, that resistance and see how exhausting it is that was a part of the lesson and really we um we learned a lot from the experience so i think it's important that we learned as much from the other side as they may have learned from us so i think we should make that more clear because you touch upon a really great idea where the reason we we were faced with so much hatred was because of this american flag we forest grove is home to many veterans which is awesome the 
obstacle was why did they feel this way about taking down the flag? Why were they so opposed to growing together? Um, right, and it was, the, the funny part was that a lot of it was opposition to taking down the flag, not necessarily the, the new mural. In fact, there was not a lot of acknowledgement that this new mural said, like, let's grow together, had a land acknowledgement, had the American flag incorporated. It was just this idea that this huge American flag was going to be taken down, even if the new design would have an American flag in it, that was part of the problem. And so we had a lot of conversations where I think Carson and I truly grew and learned about the other perspective, because to be honest, you know, for me personally, and you know, this is my own personal statement that doesn't mean I haven't learned to empathize with the other side, the American flag represents colonialism. And so for me, it's, it's like, I don't have so many emotions tied up with the flag, but I learned to really empathize and understand with people who did, because many people came up to us and said, this is what this means to us. And so we actually, you know, part of the compromise was we made sure there was an American flag in our design when we heard that people uh, did not like the fact that that was coming down and that was part of the resistance to a new mural coming up at all. Yeah. You know, we, we had to saved, compromise. We even saved the, the paint chips from the original American flag to have a ceremony and to have um, shout out to Charlotte Lume. She helped us out and helped um, take all of, we swept up every single paint so we could, you know, give our thanks to those paint chips that were the American flag and um. compromise. And that is where I thought the racism came into play because compromising elements within the design Show, showed the Forest Grove's co city council's true colors, at least within some of the members of the group, because you're asking a person of color to continue to change their ideas. Now, that was to make everybody happy. Not yeah, everybody is happy. Where, where was that? Um, 70 years ago, what compromises were made so everybody had equal access to water fountains? And, and that's just one, one example. And now that is just getting more frustrating, but within these city council members, I wanted to cuss out my computer because again, when it comes to the accessibility, if you wanted to say a word about something in your community, you had to go in person and you had two minutes before the city council meeting even started to say something. Now. Yeah. That was. Not everybody has access to ability to go in person. That was difficult. Well, you weren't able to respond to any comments that were made. Yeah, I mean. We recognize that not all communities have the time, space, energy to execute an activism of social aspects because of the time commitment of because of the safety precautions that need to go in and if you can't if you can't protect your family and you ha you have to go in person i mean i think that just continues to speak to different structural uh suppressions within our within our government yeah, I think that that was a great segue because you talked a little bit about, um, you mentioned the word, I think, suppression just then. And so I want to touch on activism as um, the different ways it can manifest and also just the way that suppression can manifest in ways that are not obvious to the eye. Um, so, you know, activism can be many, many things. And as two people who helped run an activism club and are running one, um, and also, you know, Carson herself here helped organize a walkout and then I organi helped organize another one. I've experienced organizing walkouts and talking about what activism looks like at different levels. And so it doesn't just have to be like a walkout and a protest. It can be anything that really gets people to think differently. And that's the thing about this wall was that we had a lot of conversations from the start about how to make sure that this wasn't merely performative, that it was actually inciting change and being something that moves people. And so part of that was making sure that, you know, we involved community members um, that we were open to compromise, even though that was a hard learning curve and like that was hard to compromise, mm. but we wanted to be it sure that we were, it was very frustrating, but we wanted to be sure that we were open to conversation. So whenever people would approach us and we were working on okay. this, the last thing we would do was just, would just say like, no, no. go away or we like, to hear their perspective. 
yeah so we would ask them so like why does this make you upset can we hear about what you're what what you're thinking like is there things in the design that make you upset are there things that um yeah that you would would do differently because we would we wanted to hear those we wanted to have a genuine yeah. conversation with people and that was part of the change so we were making sure that so this was um changing the way that the city council functioned too because that they would now have this policy in place about how to do future murals is what they're hopefully working on but also that we're we're conversating with the people that we're working on the wall with and i mean i think that was evident because somebody even came up to us and and they they pulled up and you know, we had a lot of people come up to us. So every time someone came up to us, it was a little bit scary because you never knew what perspective they were coming from. Mm -hmm. And he said yeah. that he was a Trump supporter and that he initially absolutely hated this wall. And then, then he said that he had seen us out here night and day, which is true because we had to be out there at night to outline it with a projector, that he had seen us out there night and day working on this mural. And he, he now respected it because of the time and effort that we put in it that he maybe didn't fully agree, but he respected us and respected our work. And that was kind of to us a first step in the right direction. Like that's what we wanted to hear. That people, yeah, that people would respect other people for the work that they're doing. And so, you know, it's just really important to emphasize that you can be an activist in whatever you choose to do. It doesn't have to be as big as going to a protest or even creating a mural. It can be, you are an activist in the places that you shop and your everyday little actions. And that's something that I really want to emphasize. Um, and so to us, you know, this was our and form of activism. reaching out to your community, uh, Sima and I are, we called Adelante Mujeres, reached out to the public schools, the high schools to have that volunteer sheet be spread out as far as we could. But, you know, we also had to take precautions for COVID-19. And we did stumble on some uh, no COVID scares or anything, but the mural is still not finished because of a COVID scare. And that's because we wanted to protect our community. However, it looks bad on us now because the mural is still not finished and Seema and I have went home for the holidays. And so it just shows is no matter what you do, it's gonna be a learning process. And I, I'm gonna constantly try to be an active listener forever and always, even though I know you and I are chatty Cathy's, but you know, it's time for the white man to to change or to give somebody else the mic. Right, and I, I kind of want to expand on that point that not, not give us an excuse, but also just elaborate that, you know, the first email we sent for this mural was back in June. And we were hoping it would be a quick approval process and that we would get this up. And this was a learning process, not just with the city council and the bureaucracy where you had to like have things submitted at a certain time and it took like weeks to get a meeting and then weeks to get approval and like all this jazz and then weeks to get a grant. Um, it was also working with an artist. We'd never done that before. And so, you know, there were multiple times where the artist didn't give us, you know, exactly what he promised on time, which was frustrating. And so we had to work with multiple different barriers a lot of which having to do with bureaucracy and time and paperwork. And this didn't get passed until October 2nd, which was well into the colder season. And so, you know, you do see some blue skies, but we, we did council try to work. Meetings. Sorry? We went to four different city council meetings. Yeah, we, we went to a lot of meetings and they only have about like one meeting every couple of weeks and maybe even a month, I think. And so, um, so that was frustrating on our behalf. And then, you know, winter started right so it's October November December and so we only really had like a month to start scraping the wall that like we could we had to wait until we were fully approved before we even began really like scraping the wall the and first that, day that Seema and I were out there was the day that Joe Biden is known to have like gotten all the votes sort of I guess considering the news but you know, yeah, no, that was that was amazing because I remember we were walking on it, and people were walking by and they were like, they were yeah. happy not only to see the, you know, to hear the news, but to see us working on that wall. So that was really so cool. I know that we're getting close to an end and there are some things that I still wanted to mention, especially when it comes to art as activism. Interesting looking at the history and different aspects of American history when like there were in like the 1920s through 1940s, Mexican muralists came from Mexico from the Mexican Renaissance to like like Diego Rivera, David Alfaro Siqueiros, and 
some other missionaries who like engaged in art to re reorient art history because they knew what the power of representation held within a community and how that speaks volumes to create change and their goal was actually to go against imperialistic ideas maybe use art sometimes as a way to make a difference and i think portland is a really strong example of you know Simo and i could have gone out there and just done this to graffiti and we thought about this we really did we thought oh you know should we put up a whole different mural or the risks we're willing to take we were going through this process it made it legal it created the conversation when so many people sent in letters to voice their opinion on this mural was the number one time that Forest Grove received that much conversation in the city council. And it really made a difference because you could tell that the city council members were shocked, but also excited. And hurt. right. Learned a lot about the level of complexity that comes along with putting up a mural and um, there, I think that we also learned a lot about just to what extent there is a lack of transparency, transparency and accessibility within um, bureaucratic entities. And so that spoke volumes to us about who can do this kind of work, um, who has the time to balance this kind of thing. And, and also how in a way that that bureaucracy is suppression of dissent. And so I just want that to be my last point because I um, think it's really important. Um, you know, there's a suppression of dissent course. I highly recommend you take it with Jules Boykoff here. He is incredible and he's where I learned of the concept. But basically suppression of dissent is when you are limiting people's ability to dissent or be activists. And you can see this with the idea um, of forcing people to fill out forms to have protests so where they have to like um you know like basically have um i forgot what the word is but it is like a um permission slip basically to protest in a certain area and that's literally taking away the activist part because you're getting permission to to protest and so that there's this balance of like you don't want to break the law you want to do it the right way so that they don't have a reason to stop you but then at the same time that is suppression and that is limiting and in, in the sense that you know you can't just go out and paint you have to go through this five six month process that other people may have not had to go through to have your voice heard and so i want to emphasize that bureaucracy to a certain extent can suppress dissent because it, it literally gives you instead of having you just, you know, be an activist and go outside the frame, you have you have another framework to work within. And so that's a really important point. And I think I highly recommend you all take that course. And, um, and uh, yeah, I hope you consider that point because it's something that's really interesting to talk mm -hmm. about. I agree. And I, that's a great way to close. And um, you're going to see some future emails where people congratulated us. And it was, that's awesome. I want to say that I've learned to Something that I wish I would have done in this process is maybe written for 10 minutes every day of what happened or the way I felt. And so that's something that I'm going to take with me to get better and in the future is make sure I write down as well as um, believe in magic. I know that sounds kind of silly, but within this project, Seema and I are both applied sustainability majors and knowing that like we have this deep connection and passion for caring for this environment. The only way that an environment can be sustainable is if it's socially sustainable too. And that kind of speaks to our project of, this is the first step in having people care about the land that they're living on and what they're doing to that land or the products that they're buying and how that has so many systematically different factors tying into the future of what our world looks like. But you have to have the people who are in this community feeling safe and comfortable and operating efficient efficiently and you know ascending together otherwise it's not going to be sustainable and i think that the really important thing to hit on what carson just said is there's growth and discomfort so it's okay to be uncomfortable and just know that other people are uncomfortable with you and there to support you and that what matters is that you persevere through the discomfort and you really take time to reflect and grow with your discomfort mm -hmm. so i just i think that that's really important and i hope that that is a main takeaway just like having hope and perseverance and 
learning to reflect on your discomfort and grow through it. So mm -hmm. yeah, because this was uncomfortable sometimes, but we we worked to get through that. Hey, thank you, Seema, for for enduring this with me because I would have never been able to do it alone. And I know there were times where we wanted to quit, but I'm very grateful that we never did quit. Too, yeah. I hope I mean that's an important thing too, and we can always elaborate on that more when we yeah. answer questions. But we wanted to quit. So I'm glad that we're here and that we didn't. And uh, thank you all for listening uh, and being so patient with us. Ciao.